As Behind the Code has continued to grow on Displaced Gamers, we built a video library containing the details of how various NES games work. With a chunk of reference material now available for specific games, it makes it easier to dive deeper into a concept and cite previous videos for comparison. It also means that, on occasion, we may elect to push deeper into the field of computer science. Welcome to Behind the Code Leveled Up, a technical series devoted to the logic that drives various games of old. It's a companion series to Behind the Code, and you may see it pop up on occasion as the flagship series continues. So with no apologies made for how technical things might be in this video, let's dive into the topic of frames versus time, as well as some nuts and bolts of game engine logic. In previous episodes of the main series, we've examined how games handle the timing of creating new video frames. Some games run at 60 frames per second with minimal issues. If we just count frames every time NMI occurs to signal the end of a single frame, Mario moves and the background scrolls every 1 60th of a second. This is ideal and is pretty straightforward. Other games are more complex. Some games are designed for 60 FPS but often miss the mark. Mega Man 3 is a great example of this. Logic for a new frame may not finish in time, the game stalls updating screen makeup until the logic is completed, and this results in slowdown. This stall tactic is performed by design, and we have what are called lag frames to fill in time between updates. Strider is an example of a game that does not do this by design. It doesn't care about running out of time and just pushes a new frame to the screen even if it is in the middle of updating sprites. This results in graphics corruption on the screen. Strider tries to maintain a frame rate at the cost of letting everything else break. Viewer Nathan M implemented lag frames into Strider to see how it would perform with the proper checks in place, and the game slowed down quite a bit. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uses the time period of two frames drawn to the television screen to execute logic and create the next frame shown. As new frame logic is split across two periods of 1 60th of a second, we can say the game runs at 30 FPS. This is done by design, and even then it is often not enough time to get the work done. Sacrificing frames for the sake of performance has been around a long time. Speaking of sacrificing frames, as of this video we have yet to dive into games developed by Micronix. Micronix's approach to FPS on the NES can be summarized by the phrase, 30 FPS is an overachievement. We'll get to Micronix and their games at some point. Meanwhile, one game we have examined in Behind the Code that presents an interesting case study in frame management is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Even though the game appears to have a less than smooth frame rate while playing as Jekyll, I didn't know just how slow it was until we started changing walking speed and examining frame updates in a previous episode. So how slow is it? Well, with the bomb maniac and Jekyll moving to the right on the screen, how many frames pass before a graphics update occurs? Starting on what we'll call frame zero, let's count frames. One, two, three, four. Both of them moved on frame four, but let's keep going. Five, six, seven, eight. Bomb Maniac moves, nine, Jekyll moves, and the screen scrolls. 10, 11, 12, 13, they both moved again. 14, 15, 16, 17, Bomb Maniac, 18, Jekyll plus a screen scroll. So it looks like we are alternating between either both of them moving and the screen scrolling after four frames, or the Bomb Maniac moving after four frames and Jekyll moving and the screen scroll happening on the fifth frame. However, starting on frame 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, both Jekyll and the Bomb Maniac reach their next pose, 32, the screen scrolls. What does this tell us? The arrival of graphical updates is inconsistent compared to the timing of video output frames. Game logic processing is not allocated to the time period of specific video output frames in order to follow some sort of frame rhythm. It would appear that Jekyll and Hyde runs at a variable frame rate between 12 and 15 FPS. Sometimes all objects move and the screen scrolls after four frames, and sometimes those actions are split across the duration spanning four to five frames. The question that comes to mind is, what? Actually, the question is, how? The answer is complex. I'd recommend three tacos for this one. Let's get started. Like several games we've covered in previous episodes, this one uses a jump handler, as I like to call it, in order to know where to go to process the associated logic for a given action. This approach is helpful as it allows flexibility for the execution of specific bits of logic without the need to perform the assembly equivalent of a gigantic if-else-if -if block every single frame. How do we manage what the jump handler will process? A block of RAM addresses spanning 200 hex to 23F is designated for what I will call the action queue. The jump handler uses this queue to know what action to process next. Each byte contained in the queue represents an item to be processed. The following bytes are loaded into the empty queue at the start of level 1. Two separate bytes are used to maintain the offsets for the next action ID to process as well as the next open slot in the queue. 
When it is time for the jump handler to process the next action, the byte at the starting address is loaded from the queue, erased from the queue, and then used to find the destination address so the jump handler can send us to the associated logic. As the action queue logic involves removing the next action to be processed, many if not most of the logic blocks executed following a jump from the jump handler are responsible for adding themselves back into the queue. At some point, spawn logic will create an enemy such as the bomb maniac and add his action ID to the queue. This new action ID byte joins the others and the queue grows in size. As action ID bytes are retrieved, removed, processed, and replaced in the action queue, the RAM locations for them move higher and higher in RAM until they wrap around from 23F to 200 hex. The transition from Jekyll to Hyde and vice versa includes erasing the current action queue and loading a fresh set of action IDs for processing the appropriate logic. Due to the volatile nature of the action queue, omitting any bytes from the initial action byte injection sequence, such as those used at the start of a level, will remove that logic from processing for the remainder of that level. For example, removing 26 hex from the initial queue injection will disable collision detection for spiders and slingshot fire. The bomb maniac has spawned in this example and his action ID of 45 hex was added to the queue. It is loaded and processed so the game knows how to handle his behavior. Halting execution with the escape key and removing that ID from the action queue by replacing it with zeros will disable this bomb maniac as he is no longer considered an entity for processing. As there were no instructions to remove this enemy from the screen, his sprites are left behind and are therefore still processed and moved to the left as gameplay continues and the screen scrolls. Since the various enemies or objects added to the playfield require a single byte be injected into the queue to tell the game to process said object, it's easy to manipulate code and prevent that processing from occurring. It would appear that queue manipulation is an easy way to make major changes to gameplay, and this is a teaser of things to come. While we're on the subject of enemy handlers, a group of them, like townspeople, may share the same handler but have different sprites to represent different characters. The Bomb Maniac and the Slingshot Kid have their own independent handlers. You can have up to four Bs on the screen, and each of them has its own handler depending on which slot it was assigned in RAM. The four handlers are very similar in their code makeup, and minimal code was changed to tailor each B handler to the associated RAM addresses. Those of you that write code in the modern era may find this a bit perplexing. Are we seeing an instance of a programming copy and paste operation? Why not just write a loop? One may argue that performance was a deciding factor, that programming wished to save some CPU cycles by not iterating through a loop or skipping over unused B slots. To accomplish this, they eliminated looping logic and sacrificed ROM space for the sake of faster execution speed. While loop unrolling is an interesting topic in computer science that would explain this reasoning, especially for this era of programming, I believe the primary reason for this method was so each B had a separate action ID in the action queue and followed action injection and removal logic. Okay, but... Why split up code for minimal performance gains and for the sake of maintaining separate action IDs in the queue? Why is this important? It seems trivial. The answer lies in how this approach at a micro level feeds into the game engine's design for frame output timing on a macro level. Jekyll and Hyde's approach to frame rate would seem to be rather untraditional versus our previous game examples. Let's say the game was designed for 30 FPS, more specifically that the game was designed to perform all logic required for a new frame inside 1 30th of a second, best illustrated as two video output frames, each of which takes 1 60th of a second. Perhaps the first 1 60th of a second would involve processing player input and testing Jekyll attacks. And during the second 1 60th, we'd have enemy actions like spawn logic, enemy movement, and enemy attacks. It's a very crude theoretical example and is far from complete or even accurate, but the point is that this implementation uses a deliberate allocation of specific logic to a specific period of time, to either the first half or the second half of work for the creation of the next new frame. This design is about allocating specific processing to specific time periods. What Jekyll and Hyde would seem to do is not worry about allocation, but rather duration. It blurs the lines by not worrying about each video output frame. It uses the action queue to hold most of the work that needs to be done and just lets it take place over a flexible period of about four to five frames. To find out how this is accomplished, we tumble further down the rabbit hole. There is a value maintained in RAM that is initialized to 30 when the game begins and has one subtracted from it each time an action is added to the queue. The game starts by loading five items into the queue and this value of interest therefore immediately drops to 25. 
If we monitor the value during gameplay, we can see that it decreases as more enemies are on the screen and increases as they are defeated or despawn. Behind the scenes, it's really a matter of the size of the action queue changing. The jump handler increases the value when it pulls an action ID out of the queue for processing, and the subroutine that inserts a new action into the queue decreases the value. Why start with the value of 30 and decrement it as you load items into the action queue? And what is the value used for anyway? The answer comes courtesy of action ID 9, an action responsible for throttling the frame rate of the game. And the best way to explain what I mean by throttling the frame rate is to simply turn it off by removing action ID 9 from the action queue initialization routine. And here is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde running at full speed. This is not overclocked. This is not an emulator trick. In fact, let's move from an emulator to a genuine NES paired with a Game Genie code. The scrolling is smooth, but the game has a few hiccups as more enemies arrive or graphics aren't loaded properly before use. The frame rate is essentially unlocked in the NES sense of the term. We just turned Jekyll and Hyde into Strider. This count we maintain in RAM is used by the handler for Action ID 9, the frame rate throttle routine. Its purpose is to dictate how long the game stalls before resuming main game logic, including resuming the processing of the action queue. Therefore, let's call it stall time bank count, as it represents units of time during which we want the CPU to do nothing. Since we disabled this action, all action queue items are processed as soon as possible without delay. The gameplay itself accelerates. Under normal circumstances, action ID 09 is present in the action queue and executes a nested loop. The inside loop iterates from 0 to 255 and wastes about 2800 CPU cycles. After that, the outside loop counter is incremented and the internal loop starts again. This process is repeated until the external loop counter matches the value of our stall time bank count. At this point, enough time has passed to allow normal game execution to resume. I've added comments above the loop that spell out the cycle counts. The counts are much more subjective once you figure in the execution of the NMI handler at the end of each frame. Speaking of NMI, if you're familiar with the typical cycle count breakdown across NES video output frame time, the cycles listed for NMI may appear to be a bit peculiar. More specifically, the cycle count would seem way too large for NMI. This example value is correct. More on that in a bit. Meanwhile, I used this count inside three examples of cycles wasted for three different bank values. The difference between stalling for 24 banks versus 18 banks is about 14,000 cycles. For reference, a single frame on an NTSC NES contains close to 29,780 and a half CPU cycles. So the difference in stall time for six additional action items in the queue is roughly about half a frame. The more action IDs you need to process, the less time you need to stall after their logic is complete. I think the most important word to use in regard to timing here is the word subjective. We don't know the exact amount of time each action handler is going to take. Collision detection takes a lot longer than processing a single B, for example. As the numbers are so subjective, let's take a more artistic approach to understanding CPU execution time for actions by illustrating it on top of the frames during which it takes place. Since the frame rate is a variable, we need to choose a starting line, where we will be reluctantly crouched. Let's start at the moment when the most recent frame rate throttling logic is complete. This moment here. Using video output frames to illustrate time flow, here is that moment in time in the event viewer. We'll continue execution and mark breakpoints for the moment we jump to a specific action logic address, as well as when NMI occurs to signal the end of the current video frame. The first action we address is collision detection. It begins here. Note that the logic following this jump is not for all collision detection and may also be responsible for performing other duties. The start of the next action occurs here. Without walking the code, it would seem that collision detection and any additional logic took just under a third of frame time to pass. I haven't reversed what the next action does, so we'll label it unknown along with its address location and code. Next up is the handler for the bomb on the screen. The previous unknown section didn't take too long. After that is the bomb maniac handler. The bomb handler didn't take too long. After that, NMI occurs. This happens at a moment when we are still processing the bomb maniac logic. We have to pause bomb maniac work in order to process NMI related stuff and then we can resume his handler. We usually see NMI logic executed within the vertical blanking period of a video frame. NMI is of course an interrupt and RTI return from interrupt is used to resume logic we were executing at the time that NMI occurred. The game does extra work during NMI, including waiting for two specific moments during video output. 
an infinite loop waits on the frame to end, and a second infinite loop waits on the sprite zero hit to occur here. After that, additional work is done, and then finally we return from interrupt here. Bomb Maniac logic resumes at this point. The next action is the controller check action, and it occurs here. So, Bomb Maniac processing took this area before NMI plus this sliver of time after RTI. Following controller checks is a level specific item that I haven't reversed. Finally, we reach the frame rate throttle action ID 09. That puts us in a loop to stall for time. So, stall time begins. NMI occurs, end of frame. Then we end another frame. Then we end another frame. And then just after passing the halfway point of the next frame, we finish the throttle routine and have completed a loop of game logic. The total number of action handlers obviously increases and decreases depending on how many objects or actions need to be processed. The more actions there are, the shorter amount of time the throttle routine will take up. This illustrates how the throttle routine is designed to pace the rate of new frame updates. Again, it's very subjective. This is just a single instance of action queue processing. If we examine back-to-back -back instances of a full action queue with throttle routine time, there's a bit of a time variance. Let's say 4.15 video output frames followed by 4.6, rough estimates. The differences in execution time aren't that much. At a glance, the obvious difference between the two sets is the number of times NMI occurs, four versus five. The difference is what causes the discrepancy in execution time as the same main game logic is executed across each set. When we examined animation on a frame-by-frame -frame basis earlier, we seemed to alternate between four and five frames on a fairly consistent basis. Since we were alternating frame time consistently, the game still managed to maintain the desired pace. The question about this entire system of frame handling by way of an action queue plus a calculated waste of time is how well does it scale when the engine is under significant load? And the answer is not very well. Allow me to present level six. It starts off innocent enough, but the handling of the barrels would seem to be rather buggy. We'll monitor the stall time bank count as the level plays. It begins at 30 minus the five initial action IDs at the start of the level as usual. Barrels appear as we begin to make progress. Behind the scenes, action ID 29 hex contains some RNG and is responsible for spawning barrels. It is injected as we reach certain milestones in the level, and IDs 2A and 2B would seem to be the barrel handlers. Bouncing and rolling are the two types. We can halt execution, remove that pair of handlers from the queue, and see that the barrels are frozen in place as expected. As for action ID 29 hex, we can disable that with a single game genie code and therefore remove barrel spawn RNG. That action ID 29 hex would seem to have an issue with its implementation as it follows standard action queue processing and injects itself back into the queue as part of its logic, but also has additional instances added to the action queue as we continue to reach new milestones in level progress. Perhaps this is by design and is meant to increase the rate of barrels appearing depending on how fast you are progressing through the level. Regardless, the duplicate instances of that action ID reduce the stall time bank count significantly. This means that the frame rate throttle routine stalls for one less frame, two instances of NMI pass when the bank count is at 13, for example. With less time wasted between frame updates, gameplay accelerates. Fortunately, there is some mercy logic behind the scenes that purges barrel RNG instances from the queue when criteria is met. That said, you're more likely to take enough stress to become hide before that happens. As if the difficulty of the barrels in the Bomb Maniac weren't enough, how about we change the speed of the game and make it faster? Bug or feature? Most games slow down when you have too many objects to process. The CPU doesn't finish a new frame of work within a set amount of time. The opposite happens with Jekyll and Hyde. If the frame rate isn't throttled, the game runs at ludicrous speed. When throttle timing is operational, it depends on action queue load. This time, too many objects to process means the game speeds up instead of slows down. It's almost as if the game were designed to have a calm pace by default, but intentionally shift to a frantic pace as more enemies appear by literally altering the frame rate of the game. Whoa. Nah, it's probably just a bug. Like, subscribe, and comment for more videos like this one. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested, and thanks for watching.